This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 27 One morning, as we were engaged in giving the last finish to our staircase, we were alarmed at hearing at a distance strange, sharp, prolonged sounds, like the roars of a wild beast, but mingled with an unaccountable hissing. Our dogs erected their ears, and prepared for deadly combat. I assembled my family. We then ascended our tree, closing the lower door, loaded our guns, and looked anxiously round. But nothing appeared. I armed my dogs with their porcupine coats of mail and collars, and left them below to take care of our animals. The horrible howlings seemed to approach nearer to us. At length Fritz, who was leaning forward to listen as attentively as he could, threw down his gun, and, bursting into a loud laugh, cried out, "'It is our fugitive, the ass! Come back to us!' and singing his song of joy on his return. We listened and were sure he was right, and could not but feel a little vexation at being put into such a fright by a donkey. Soon after we had the pleasure of seeing him appear among the trees, and what was still better, he was accompanied by another animal of his own species, but infinitely more beautiful. I knew it at once to be the Onagra, or wild ass a most important capture if we could make it, although all naturalists have declared it impossible to tame this elegant creature, yet I determined to make the attempt. I went down with Fritz, exhorting his brothers to remain quiet, and I consulted with my privy counsellor on the means of taking our prize. I also prepared, as quickly as possible, a long cord with a noose, kept open by a slight stick which would fall out as soon as the animal's head entered, while any attempt to escape would only draw the noose closer. The end of this cord was tied to the root of a tree. I then took a piece of bamboo, about two feet long, and splitting it up, tied it firmly at one end, to form a pair of pincers for the nose of the animal. In the meantime, the two animals had approached nearer, our old grizzle apparently doing the honours to his visitor and both grazing very comfortably. By degrees we advance softly to them, concealed by the trees, Fritz carrying the lasso, and I the pincers. The Onagra, as soon as he got sight of Fritz, who was before me, raised his head and started back, evidently only in surprise, as it was probably the first man the creature had seen. Fritz remained still, and the animal resumed his browsing. Fritz went up to our old servant, and offered him a handful of oats mixed with salt. The ass came directly to eat its favourite treat. Its companion followed, raised its head, snuffed the air, and came so near that Fritz adroitly threw the noose over its head. The terrified animal attempted to fly, but that drew the cord so tight as to almost to stop his respiration and he lay down, his tongue hanging out. I hastened up, and relaxed the cord, lest he should be strangled. I threw the halter of the ass round his neck, and placed the split cane over his nose, tying it firmly below with a string. I subdued this wild animal by the means that blacksmiths use the first time they shoe a horse. I then took off the noose, and tied the halter by two long cords to the roots of two separate trees and left him to recover himself. In the meantime, the rest of the family had collected to admire this noble animal, whose graceful and elegant form, so superior to that of the ass, raises it almost to the dignity of a horse. After a while it rose, and stamped furiously with its feet, trying to release itself, but the pain in its nose obliged it to lie down again. Then my eldest son and I, approaching gently, took the two cords, and led or dragged it between two roots very near to each other, to which we tied the cords so short that it had little power to move, and could not escape. 
We took care our own donkey should not stray again, by tying his forefeet loosely and putting on him a new halter, and left him near the Onagra. I continued, with a patience I never had in Europe, to use every means I could think of with our new guest, and at the end of a month he was so far subdued that I ventured to begin his education. This was a long and difficult task. We placed some burdens on his back, but the obedience necessary before we could mount him it seemed impossible to instill into him. At last I recollected the method they use in America to tame the wild horses, and I resolved to try it. In spite of the bounds and kicks of the furious animal, I leaped on his back, and seizing one of his long ears between my teeth, I bit it till the blood came. In a moment he reared himself almost erect on his hind feet, remained for a while stiff and motionless, then came down on his forefeet slowly, I still holding on his ear. At last I ventured to release him. He made some leaps, but soon subsided into a sort of trot, I having previously placed loose cords on his forelegs. From that time we were his masters. My sons mounted him one after another. They gave him the name of Lightfoot, and never animal deserved his name better. As a precaution, we kept the cords on his legs for some time, and as he never would submit to the bit, we used a snaffle, by which we obtained power over his head, guiding him by a stick, with which we struck the right or left ear as we wished him to go. During this time our poultry-yard was increased by three broods of chickens. We had at least forty of these little creatures chirping and pecking about, the pride of their good mistress's heart. Part of these were kept at home, to supply the table, and part she allowed to colonize in the woods, where we could find them when we wanted them. These, she said, are of more use than your monkeys, jackals, and eagles, who do nothing but eat, and would not be worth eating themselves, if we were in need. However, she allowed that there was some use in the buffalo, who carried burdens, and Lightfoot, who carried her sons so well. The fowls, which cost us little for food, would be always ready, she said, either to supply us with eggs or chickens, when the rainy season came on, the winter of this climate. This reminded me that the approach of that dreary season permitted me no longer to defer a very necessary work for the protection of our animals. This was to construct, under the roots of the trees, covered houses for them. We began by making a kind of roof above the vaulted roots of our tree. We used bamboo canes for this purpose. The longer and stouter were used for the supports, like columns. The slighter ones, bound together closely, formed the roof. The intervals we filled up with moss and clay, and spread over the whole a coating of tar. The roof was so firm that it formed a platform, which we surrounded with a railing and thus we had a balcony, and a pleasant promenade. By the aid of some boards nailed to the roots, we made several divisions in the interior, each little enclosure being appropriated to some useful purpose, and thus stables, poultry-houses, dairy, larder, hay-house, storeroom, etc., besides our dining-room, were all united under one roof. This occupied us some time as it was necessary to fill our storeroom before the bad weather came, and our cart was constantly employed in bringing useful stores. One evening, as we were bringing home a load of potatoes on our cart, drawn by the ass, the cow, and the buffalo, I saw the cart was not yet full. I therefore sent home the two younger brothers with their mother, and went on with Fritz and Ernest to the oak wood to collect a sack of sweet acorns. Fritz mounted on his onagra, Ernest followed by his monkey, and I carrying the bag. On arriving at the wood, we tied Lightfoot to a tree, and all three began to gather the dropped acorns, when we were startled by the cries of birds, and a loud flapping of wings, and we concluded that a brisk combat was going on between Master Nips and the tenants of the thickets, from whence the noise came. Ernest went softly to see what was the matter 
and we soon heard him calling out, "'Be quick! A fine heath-fowl's nest full of eggs! Nips wants to suck them, and the mother is beating him!' Fritz ran up, and secured the two beautiful birds, who fluttered and cried out furiously, and returned, followed by Ernest, carrying a large nest filled with eggs. The monkey had served us well on this occasion, for the nest was so hidden by a bush with long leaves, of which Ernest had his hand full, that, but for the instinct of the animal, we could never have discovered it. Ernest was overjoyed to carry the nest and eggs for his dear mamma, and the long pointed leaves he intended for Francis, to serve as little toy swords. We set out on our return, placing the sack of acorns behind Fritz on Lightfoot. Ernest carried the two fowls, and I charged myself with the care of the eggs, which I covered up as I found they were warm, and I hoped to get the mother to resume her brooding when we got to Falcon's Nest. We were all delighted with the good news we should have to carry home, and Fritz, anxious to be first, struck his charger with a bunch of the pointed leaves he had taken from Ernest. This terrified the animal so much that he took the bit in his teeth and flew out of sight like an arrow. We followed in some uneasiness, but found him safe. Master Lightfoot had stopped of himself when he reached his stable. My wife placed the valuable eggs under a sitting hen, the true mother refusing to fulfil her office. She was then put into the cage of the poor parrot, and hung in our dining-room, to accustom her to society. In a few days the eggs were hatched, and the poultry-yard had an increase of fifteen little strangers, who fed greedily on bruised acorns, and soon became as tame as any of our fowls, though I plucked the large feathers out of their wings when they were full-grown, lest their wild nature should tempt them to quit us. End of chapter.